uh, GE's first order for a DC system, well, first we bid on a project in South Africa in uh, 1968, and this was uh, from... Uh, when, when did you come from Pittsfield? Oh, in, in 51, I was in Central... So you, you had a majority of your time in, in Schenectady yes, as yes. far as headquarters? Yes, yes absolutely. I uh, started in 51 and retired in 91, yeah. so I was... But uh, every assignment was like a new company. <laughs> so, but anyway... Uh, the uh, first, uh, well, the project in South Africa was uh, 1,900 uh, megawatts, uh, and it was long distance from Mozambique, hydro to South Africa. That and, and that was a large undertaking because we were talking about uh, solid state, and we went down with people from Philadelphia to, to uh, try to get that order. But the German companies uh, at that time, uh, B Brown Bavaria Company and AEG, yeah, and it, uh, but and it was still Brown Bavaria at that it, time. It was, and Siemens uh, uh, got that contract, and uh, it uh, it would have been a great challenge because there were lots not only building the first uh, uh, 400 kV system on with solid state. But uh, uh, there were revolutions going on there, and actually I understood that there was a German army division protecting the building of the terminal in Mozambique. So there, okay, that, it was uh, one step at a time to do these things. And uh, uh, one point I would make is GE's approach was very conservative. For example, uh, others, when they started uh, talking about solid state, uh, thought about uh, deionized water uh, to cool them. And that is very efficient, but uh, if you think about it, uh, there are a lot of ways for that to leak and cause problems. So the GE approach was very conservative. Everything was air-cooled in fiberglass structures. So there was never any problem in that respect. Uh, I'll get to the point of how the failures occurred in these systems when people did use the water cooling. But anyway, as time went on, uh, there were projects uh, in the U.S. There was one that uh, GE got, which was 500 megawatts from North Dakota coal fields to Duluth, the Square Butte project. And uh, that was a substantial try for a, a the voltage was uh, 250 kV plus and minus. And it was a very good step from Eel River, which was actually a frequency changer. So the rectifier and the inverter was right there in one location. Uh, meanwhile, uh, there was a 100 kV, uh, 100, uh, excuse me, a 1,000 megawatt project that went from North Dakota oil uh, coal fields to Minneapolis, the CU project. and. Uh, ASEA got that. Uh, and following that, uh, there was a big project in Brazil in uh, uh, 1979. Uh, and that was actually 6,000 uh, 6, megawatts, so 6 million kilowatts. So that was still under uh, Mr. Jones. Yes. Yes, it was. Jack hadn't taken Jack over Jack quite had yet. Jack still 10 years. Right. However, uh, we learned some kind of a lesson there that someone recently said, oh, we can't compete internationally. We were 20% low on the bid price on, mm -hmm. on that. And then about a month after the bid price, people start saying, well, when is the rebid? And my reaction was, what do you mean rebid? We've been working on this for a year. We put in a bona fide bid and agreed that we'd reveal that they wanted information on how to make these uh, silicon devices. And we were required to open up and show them. And uh, anyway, ASEA got it. 
So to go forward, uh, some years later, I went to a DC committee meeting down in uh, Brazil, and they showed us a movie of the fire they had in the in the one valve hall, and the whole pole, uh, the whole valve hall, uh, was well. It was one one group in a pole, so it was probably a, a 300 kV uh, valve group, uh, and these were all. Uh, suspended from the ceiling, very clever design, uh, but the water cooling uh, destroyed that whole pole. So we were somewhat vindicated, but they proceeded then to improve their system and they've continued and gotten away with it. Same thing happened to Siemens. I think they had uh, a failure at Chateauguay, which was a frequency changer up in uh, Quebec. To pick up on the uh, development of the HVDC business. Within GE, over a period of, uh, well, from uh, the late 1960s to mid-85, uh, uh, we, or mid-86, I guess it was, uh, GE uh, had uh, 13 projects in the U.S. and Canada involving D.C. These were uh, long distance lines. They were back-to-back -back terminals. Uh, very interestingly, one of the first east-west ties was uh, put in by a utility in Nebraska where they wanted to sell power uh, to uh, to the market in uh, the West, in Colorado and uh, Wyoming. And uh, they were a very small utility, and so they chose 100 megawatts as the size of a non-synchronous link. And uh, prior to that, they were able to close these lines, but any time there was a, a uh, uh, deviation or a fault in the east or west system, the tie was not adequate to synchronize the large systems. However, with the DC link, they were free to, free to have a frequency changer. And then over time, a number of uh, ties went on that east-west tie. We had another one in Nebraska, one down in uh, Texas. Uh, there were a total of five or six in that area. Uh, there were other, uh, actually right now they're talking about a, a three terminal DC system that they're calling Three Amigos in New Mexico, which will be tied to the west, to Texas, and to the east, which are all independent, independent uh, uh, non-synchronous systems. Uh, I don't know whether that's going to proceed, but at least they're talking about it. So over this period of uh, maybe 16 or 17 years, uh, General Electric had 13 projects that uh, involved DC. However, uh, as I indicated, some of the very large systems, starting with uh, the Brazilian system, uh, ASEA secured. Uh, there were some modifications uh, of the Pacific intertie where a 1100 megawatt parallel system was put in with uh, the original system which had been upgraded to 2 million kilowatts. Uh, and again, that was uh, secured, I believe, by Siemens. And uh, so, uh, uh, there was one other one that uh, uh, ASEA secured, and that was the Intermountain Project of 1900 megawatts to Los Angeles from coal fields in Utah. In Utah. So, uh, as I say, over this time, the GE projects tended to be the smaller, but all of them were successful. They c were completed, met the commitments, and, uh, and actually, uh, I believe that ASEA did reasonably well over time once they uh, got around their water cooling problems. Uh, 
they also had uh, insulation failures in the CU project. I think they misapplied the surge arresters. Uh, they were very resourceful. We were designing our systems with one panel, of which there were many thyristors, as spare. They designed theirs with a whole pole, whole half of the system was in the warehouse. So. The Edison Tech Center presents Tech Reflections, an oral history which preserves stories about engineers, artists, and technicians, their lives, achievements, and designs as told by the people who knew them or in their own words.